Hello. Hello. All right. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the archives uh, and the uh, Alabama uh, Humanities Foundation for uh, for funding this. It is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm come to these things quite a bit, and uh, I'm just uh, uh, astounded by the quality of the program. So it's it's really an honor to be a part of it uh, at last. What I want to touch on today. And, and really that's what it is, just touching uh, on this, uh, is the resettlement of Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany uh, in Alabama. And before I get to Alabama, what I want to do is to briefly sketch uh, and, and outline the crisis that was going on uh, in Europe, in, in, in Germany with the German and the Austrian Jews, uh, and then how the national Jewish organizations responded and brought the state, brought Alabama uh, amongst the other states in the Union uh, to help alleviate uh, this crisis. Between 1933, when Adolf Hitler came to power, and 1939, with the beginning of, of World War II, um, Jews in Germany were increasingly persecuted. Uh, they were increasingly uh, um, subjected to economic boycotts, to the loss of civil rights, to the loss of citizenship. Uh, they were being incarcerated in concentration camps. And as a result, many, many immigrated, many fled Germany uh, to various other, other states, uh, the United States being uh, one of the prime one of the prime areas in which they did so. Um, at first, the Nazi government really didn't put any uh, when they arrived in the United States. That sounds a little bit better, doesn't it? Now, the turning point uh, in Germany was in November of 1938 with uh, Kristallnacht, the Night of the Broken Glass. Uh, this is really unrestrained violence against Jews, against synagogues, against Jewish-owned businesses. Uh, and it was at this point that most German Jews realized there really is no future left for them in Germany. You know, up until that point, there were many German Jews who, uh, who didn't immigrate, who figured things couldn't get any worse. And by, Chris, by the time of Kristallnacht, uh, it was very clear that yes, they could, and, and this is the point uh, when uh, many also tried to leave. Uh, and this was criticized uh, across the United States, particularly in Alabama. Alabama had, uh, we had pockets of anti-Semitism, but by and large, uh, those in leadership positions in the press and, and the government greatly supported uh, Jewish efforts to uh, provide relief to those persecuted Jews. This is another cartoon from the Age Herald. Uh, this is about a week after Kristallnacht in which they're uh, criticizing Hitler and the Nazi government for uh, their, their persecution. Now, if we go back to 1933 when Hitler took power in Germany, there were just under 600,000 Jews living in Germany. That is less than 1% of the population. There were also 185,000 Jews living in Austria, which became part of the, the, the Third Reich uh, in, uh, in early 1938. By 1940, half of those Jews had fled. Uh, and they went to uh, a number of countries, more than 100,000 went to countries in Western Europe, uh, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, countries that the Nazis uh, by, the 1940, by 1940, uh, 1941, certainly would, uh, would have conquered. Uh, you have about 8,000 that were able to make their way into Switzerland, uh, 48,000 into Great Britain, a few other of the European nations. 90,000 uh, German Jews came to the United States, uh, the largest number. About 60,000. Uh, went to Palestine, which at that point uh, was under the uh, uh, really under the control of the British, under the British mandate. Uh, about 84,000 uh, made their way into Latin America, uh, Central and South America, and about 15,000 into the Chinese 
city of Shanghai because the Japanese controlled it, but they didn't really put any uh, restrictions on who could, uh, who could go. So there, there were a lot of places that the Jews uh, fled. Um, now, let's focus on the 90,000 that came into the United States uh, between 1933 and 1939, 1939 roughly uh, 90,000. This is a number far smaller than the immigration quotas would have allowed. Uh, the United States had uh, immigration quotas from countries, uh, you, only so many from Germany, only so many from Austria, only so many from Britain. Uh, and on one year, 1939, is the only year that those quotas were actually filled. The rest of the time, we never filled the quotas, and that was due to a, to a number of reasons, primarily uh, the anti-Semitic attitudes of those at the State Department who controlled uh, uh, immigration. Just to give you an idea, the immigration quota from Germany was 27,370. Now, 1939, we filled that quota. But in 1938, over 300,000 uh, German citizens applied for a visa. We only let in 20,000. Um, let me give you an example of what it took to get a visa and to enter the United States. Because this is one of the reasons why it was such an arduous process. This is what was required by the State Department. And this, this comes from the United States Holocaust Museum, to this list here. You need five copies of a visa application. You need two copies of a birth certificate. Your quota number had to have been reached, and that's your place uh, on the waiting list to enter the U.S. You need a certificate of good conduct from the German police, uh, including, including two copies uh, of your police dossier, your prison record, and your military record. Uh, you had to have some other rec governmental records. You need affidavits of good conduct. That was required after September of 1940. You need proof that the applicant passed a physical examination at the U.S. consulate. You need proof of permission to leave Germany, which was imposed in September of 1939. Proof of the prospective immigrant, or proof that the prospective immigrant had booked passage to the Western Hemisphere. Two sponsors, and basically these had to be close relatives uh, of yours, uh, and the sponsors of the immigrants, uh, whether they were family members or not, had to be American citizens or have a permanent resident status. Uh, they had to fill out an affidavit of support and sponsorship. They needed six notary. Uh, they also had to provide a certified copy of their most recent federal tax return, an affidavit from a bank regarding their accounts, uh, and an affidavit from any other responsible person regarding uh, other assets. And usually that was an employer uh, or some other entity. Uh, and we had a historian who, who wrote extensively about uh, these immigration policies, uh, and he called these things paper walls. And, and that they were indeed uh, walls that kept out uh, so many, imposed by, by the State Department. Um, now, those that did get in generally landed in New York. That, that's where most uh, came in. And even though we didn't fill the quotas, most wanted to stay in New York. Now, this caused a problem for the New York Jewish community because they were the ones who basically had the support structure to support these, uh, uh, th this influx of larger and larger numbers uh, of Jewish refugees. Now, Jewish leaders in New York worried that this is creating another Jewish ghetto. This is something that uh, they wanted to avoid, and so they looked to resettle those recently arrived refugees uh, throughout the United States to alleviate uh, that pressure. And this is where Alabama and other states come in to accept many of these refugees, to, to help uh, integrate them into uh, American life, American culture, American society. And as you can see from the, uh, the cartoons, uh, you know, going back to, to this, there was great sympathy uh, on the part uh, of non-Jews uh, for these persecuted uh, Jewish refugees. 
Uh, most people, though, even though they, they had great uh, sympathy, they're not really going out of their way to call for increased uh, immigration, to, to open the doors to, to anyone who wants to come in. Uh, you'll, you'll see cartoons like this, you'll see editorials in the press, you'll hear pronouncements by politicians, but when it came down to saying, well, uh, let's leave, uh, let's, let more, uh, let's let more in, uh, the answer is no. Uh, and they would point to Palestine as an option. Well, why didn't the British open Palestine uh, rather than opening our doors? Uh, and and it, it, it was in Alabama. It, it really, that was a national uh, attitude. And even after Crystal knocked, even after the, the intense violence, there was a national uh, uh, survey that was taken. 94% uh, of Americans polled disapproved of the Nazi treatment of Jews. Well, that really didn't translate into any firm policy commitment because 72% of that number uh, opposed admitting large numbers of Jewish refugees into the United States. So even though they have this sympathy, it doesn't really translate into any calls for, uh, for direct action. Um, in that case. Now, one of the things about Alabama's politicians, uh, and, and I've gone through numerous uh, papers, numerous uh, correspondence here in the archives in Tuscaloosa, uh, in Birmingham, that Alabama politicians were the same. They, they criticized the British for not opening Palestine. They, they certainly didn't want to uh, you know, we're here in the middle of a, of, of a political season. We, you know, no politician's going to try to do anything or say anything controversial. And, and certainly politicians at that point didn't want to touch the immigration issue because we were in the midst of a depression. But that didn't necessarily limit their efforts when it came to their own constituents because there's numerous uh, instances where uh, you know, senators like Lister Hill or representatives like John Sparkman uh, or even uh, uh, Representative Patrick in Birmingham uh, actively uh, went to the State Department, in some cases went to the Secretary of State and advocated for their constituents and, and they were able to uh, sort of make an end run around the, uh, what we just saw and get their constituents' families uh, in to the United States. But they're not going to call for increased immigration in that sense. Now, what's going on in Alabama with Alabama's Jewish communities? Um, prior to 1938, Jewish refugees, if they reached Alabama, they reached Alabama through the efforts of their family or friends. Uh, they're the ones who sponsored it. Jewish co uh, community organizations like the Montgomery Jewish Federation, for instance, uh, or the United Jewish Fund in Birmingham, uh, they didn't actively uh, sponsor refugees. Uh, only in 1938 do communities actively take up that, uh, that role of helping to resettle uh, these refugees that had arrived in New York. Now, strictly speaking, individuals or, or community organizations like the Federation couldn't sponsor somebody. It was individuals. An individual had to sign the affidavit. So what they did instead was they would take uh, a number of individuals within the community who would do that with the promised financial backing of that organization, be it the uh, United Jewish Fund in Birmingham, the Montgomery Jewish Federation, uh, and so forth. Uh, and that's how they would help to sponsor uh, many of these, these refugees. They also began to work with a national Jewish organization, the National Coordinating Committee for Refugees from Germany. It was the NCC is what it was. And, and basically this was a, an umbrella organization that uh, coordinated the activities of over uh, 30 different uh, Jewish uh, charities and, and organizations, and they were responsible uh, for facilitating the resettlement of these Jews uh, throughout the United States. Um, and they did so for three reasons. There, there was some, some real concern in New York that 
leaving the Jews there, again, we talked about that Jewish ghetto, that that would simply cripple the support structure of the, the New York Jewish community. Uh, so they had a, a real concern about that. They also worried that an increasing number of Jews into New York in the midst of a depression would raise uh, you know, the level of anti-Semitism, and that was a real concern. Uh, there were a number of instances in Alabama during, uh, during the war in which uh, many uh, refugees who still resided in Alabama faced that. Uh, and they also assumed that by resettling refugees elsewhere that they would better uh, assimilate, would better acculturate into uh, American society. And this actually wasn't always the case. Um, you know, if you think about the Jewish refugees themselves, taking that long, you know, they had been persecuted in Germany, they had waited that long uh, wait to get into the United States, and once they got there, after that long journey, being asked to go somewhere that's totally unknown, being asked to go to Alabama, well, what did anybody know about, about Alabama and New York? Um, well, if they're in New York, they have a large Jewish population to fall back on. They have uh, employment opportunities that certainly are, are, are nothing like the opportunities in Alabama. Uh, there are a number of Jewish uh, charitable and, and um, let me say, uh, health, organ mental health organizations because the, the psychological impact on the refugees was immense. So they had all of those things in New York and all of a sudden they're being asked to, to uh, leave that uh, and go somewhere out in, in, at least from the New York point of view, out in the hinterland. Um, and so this is, not, this is not something that many Jewish refugees at least wanted to do, um, willingly wanted to do, uh, but it was at least according uh, to the, the national organizations was uh, a necessity here. We began, I'm talking about Alabama, uh, in 1938, in April of 1938, uh, to coordinate uh, to resettle these refugees. It was in the spring of 1938, a woman from Montgomery, Beatrice Kaufman, uh, she was part of the National Council for Jewish Women. She had been at a conference in Nashville and a member of the NCC uh, was there advocating for resettlement. Well, uh, Kaufman took that message back to the Federation in Montgomery, uh, and she began to urge the Federation, the Jewish community here, uh, to organize to help resettle uh, the refugees. And so by May of 1938, Montgomery, and at least the Montgomery Jewish Federation, uh, had created a local coordinating committee to work with the, the national coordinating committee uh, to accept refugees for resettlement. Now that was the first, and, and throughout 1938, you're gonna see Birmingham organized, you're gonna see Mobile organized. Well, Mobile is, is dysfunctional, at least initially. Uh, they, it takes probably until about 1940 to get their act together. Uh, but they're organizing, and they're, they're, they're at least going to attempt to accept these refugees. The president of the Montgomery Jewish Federation at the time was a man named Walter Loebman, and he claimed that it was the Jewish community's responsibility, and I'm quoting here, to render maximum service to our oppressed peoples of Europe. So much has the problems of our people increased since 1932 three because of events in Germany and other European land that responsibilities must be shared by every Jew in every community for European Jewry is calling America. So at least he's putting it in, in the larger sense that it's everyone's responsibility to, to help uh, with this crisis. Now, as I mentioned before, the major hurdle here is not so much organizing in Alabama, one of the major hurdles is the refugees uh, themselves, or at least trying to prepare them to resettle in places like Alabama. And they face the same problem in places like Mississippi and Arkansas and, and Texas in the Midwest. 
Uh, but it, 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 was, it was very tough uh, for them to, to psychologically come to grips with this. And, and this is the case as well with Holocaust survivors after the war, what were known as displaced persons, because there were other resettlement attempts after the war that, that uh, faced some of the same problems. Um, so that was one of the major problems, is, is getting the refugees ready uh, for resettlement. Now, organization and coordination of the state proceeded. Uh, by December of 1938, Alabama had created a state coordinating committee. And another Montgomeryan, Lucian Loeb, uh, was named the state chairman uh, in order to facilitate uh, coordination between the various local committees uh, and the uh, NCC. And, and by 1939, there was a new national entity created, the National Refugee Service, that basically took over the resettlement of all refugees in, uh, uh, in the uh, United States. And so it, Loeb coordinated with uh, the NCC and then the NRS uh, to try to, to, to be that uh, middleman between the local committees and the national uh, committees. Uh, Birmingham and Montgomery really served as the two centers for resettlement activity until 1940, until Mobile could get its act together. This is where the largest population of Jews in Alabama resided uh, and, and really the most, uh, had the most opportunity for employment and for uh, acculturation uh, into society uh, here. Each local community, be it Birmingham, be it Montgomery, be it Mobile, it could have been Selma, it could have been uh, uh, others in the state, and there, there were a few other places, Dothan, uh, they could set their own, and they, they used quotas here, ironically, uh, about how many refugees they would accept. So if, I think Montgomery uh, began by accepting two that's what, we'll, that's what they'll start with. We'll, we'll start with two uh, here in Montgomery. And of course it increased after that, but they would set their own. Birmingham had the largest population, the most opportunity, so they had the most refugees. Um, but each one was, uh, it was left up to each community to determine how many they accepted and uh, how they would go about facilitating resettlement, how they would go about doing it. Now, one of the problems that Alabama had is that Alabama had no, at the state level or the local level, uh, no social welf welfare agencies. And because they really didn't have this resource uh, that many of these local coordinating committees could, could basically fall back on or, or seek advice from, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a mess in the beginning. They, they weren't quite sure how to go about doing this. All they, they, they knew they needed to do something, but how to, uh, to effectively do this, uh, they learned through trial uh, and error. Uh, there are actually some uh, instances where uh, when a refugee came into a community, uh, they treated that refugee almost as a visiting dignitary. Uh, one of the first refugees that landed in Mobile uh, had been a banker uh, before the Nazis had come into, into power. And so when he uh, ultimately arrived in Mobile, uh, the Mobile Resettlement uh, Committee uh, actually hired him a maid. Uh, there's another in Mobile that, that in, in fact, one of the, the terms he said, I, you know, I felt so wined and dined that I, I feel like this is sort of a, a vacation visit rather than coming to make a living. So they, they had to figure out how to, uh, how to do this uh, through trial uh, and error. And they had a lot of support. Uh, Non-Jews supported these efforts, uh, I don't say wholeheartedly, but uh, those in prominent positions um, gave a lot of uh, time and, and energy to promoting these things. Not necessarily to, to participating, but to promoting. Grover Hall, who was the editor of the Montgomery Advertiser, uh, was a great champion of the Jewish community. In fact, there was, um, after he died, I think the uh, Tuscaloosa Hillel, uh, named a uh, award after Grover Hall. I'm not sure if that's still in place, but uh, because he uh, facilitated 
uh, such between uh, Jews and Gentiles. Um, uh, they gave him that award. They named that award after him. But he used the pages of the Montgomery Advertiser to promote uh, this resettlement uh, of refugees, calling on the community to help in any way they could, to donate, to, if they had open job, provide jobs uh, for refugees who were coming uh, into the community. Uh, you even have others that, that sort of picked up this message. Uh, people offered land to refugees uh, in Florence, in Birmingham, in Mobile. Uh, the most striking was an offer from Otagaville. Uh, a guy offered 4,500 acres, uh, and it had some factories and some mills on it, uh, basically to the, uh, the Jewish community. He was selling it for a, a very reasonable price in which hundreds of refugee families could have resettled. But this was ultimately turned down by the NRS because they really didn't fund agricultural endeavors. Uh, and, and generally, that, that wouldn't just in Alabama, that was, was across the board. But you had, uh, you had many non-Jews willing to, uh, to support this uh, as well. Now, I mentioned the problems associated with the refugees coming down. This caused a lot of issues with members of the Jewish community and the national organization because it, it, there's also some sectional distrust here, okay? It, it, you know, this is still uh, the South didn't trust the North, didn't trust New York. Uh, so, it, and again, they blamed when, when, when refugees came from New York and found, you know, small town Alabama, uh, unsuitable or not what they were used to or unsatisfying or began looking around for other opportunities, that caused a lot of resentment on the part of the local uh, Jewish community, especially those of the, uh, uh, the committee here. And they would blame the NRS, they would blame the national organization for not preparing the refugees for life. Because, you know, a lot, uh, you know, the NRS tried they had a number of programs designed to teach American history, to teach the English language. That was the biggest barrier, I think, the language barrier. Trying to learn the language, trying to learn, uh, you know, the uh, civics, uh, courses on American culture uh, to help ease them into, into their new life. And so, uh, you know, those here would uh, blame the national organizations. You're not preparing them enough. And the national organizations would respond, well, you don't really understand our situation. So it, 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 the sectional distrust uh, really came to the surface and hampered the, the, basically the cooperation between the national and the state uh, organizations. Uh, just to give you an example here, in 1940, um, there, were, there was an Alabama, much of these communities, they would request Oh, we need a tailor. You know, we, we don't have a tailor. Or we need uh, somebody to fill this position because we have an opening. Well, the, the NRS didn't operate like that. Said, we, we, we can't just find this and, and, and fill something in. You need to take who we have. And so that, uh, when, when the NRS couldn't fill two positions of, of such a specific request, uh, or they couldn't find somebody to go resettle in, in Jasper, um, in fact, Lucian Loeb stepped in in that case and sent a Montgomery refugee family uh, who had come uh, the previous year to Jasper. Well, they lasted probably about a month, maybe a month and a half, and they came back to Montgomery uh, because Jasper, they, they, they couldn't, they just didn't want to live in Jasper. And in fact, they eventually left Montgomery um, as a whole because of, they, they felt it was just unsatisfactory. This led, I think one of the main drivers in the Birmingham, Birmingham community, Mervyn Stern, and really one of the most influential in the, the Alabama Jewish community. He was uh, an investment banker, financier. Uh, and Stern, Stern was very proud that his, I think it was his grandfather had fought for the Confederacy. So he was very Southern and proud of that Southern heritage. Um, 
And he, I think more than anybody else, had tremendous distrust of northern organizations, especially northern social workers. You know, somebody coming down and telling us how to, how to run things. Um, and so this led to a suspicion of the NRS. In fact, uh, Stern, along with another Birmingham merchant who was on the state committee, Isidore Pizitz, uh, basically they viewed this not necessarily as a, a, a Jewish problem. They viewed this really as a problem uh, of the New York Jews, of the New York Jewish community. And so it's, you know, he said um, um, it, they adopted a policy, or at least they, they advocated the NRS adopt a policy of resettler else. Uh, and, you know, this is something that, that crops up, not just in, in refugee resettlement, but this also crops up in, in how Jewish communities uh, respond to um, the war effort on the home front uh, of, you know, particularly uh, entertaining uh, soldiers. Uh, there was an instance down in Dothan where Fort Rucker was, uh, was built during uh, during the early years of World War II. And almost overnight, you had, you, you went from, you know, you, you, I think the Jewish population in Dothan was about 20 families, 20 Jewish families. And almost overnight, you have uh, roughly uh, 25, 35, 40,000 Jewish soldiers stationed. Well, how do you, again, everybody's pitching in. How do you help? you know, facilitate entertainment of this in, in a Jewish fashion. And most of those were from New York and, and the, the northeastern areas. And so a common complaint is that maybe the New York Jewish community should contribute to our, you know, our, our uh, attempts to at least make life a little bit more bearable down here in Dothan uh, because we're entertaining those New York boys. So the, the sectional, it wasn't just with resettlement, the sectional differences, the sectional suspicions uh, were really across the board. Now the NRS never did that. They never adopted a resettler else policy. Uh, but this is one of the things that really put a wrench in the, uh, the inner workings of uh, the, the local uh, and the national organizations. Now, let me touch on Montgomery before I wrap it up, just glancing at the time. We, I could go on for hours. Um, and like I said, this really is just a small, small part of, of what's going on in the Jewish communities in Alabama uh, during the 1930s and the 1940s. Uh, the book that, that I have, this, this is just really scratching the surface uh, here. Um, now, Montgomery had its own coordinating committee uh, under Henry Will, and they did that in late 1938. Uh, by the beginning of 1939, they had five refugees uh, resettling here. Um, they had, I think, a quota of eight for the following year. So they were successful in, in, in these smaller numbers, but they just don't have, you know, Montgomery just doesn't have the industrial uh, base the way Birmingham does. It, it's, it's, it's agricultural, largely in nature, and so they never could support the larger, uh, the larger numbers of this. From 1938 to 1942, Montgomery resettled 25 refugees in all here. Um, according to the reports, uh, in fact, the NRS would send down field agents and they would uh, monitor what was going on and, and write reports back to, to New York. And they said they're adjusting fairly well. Um, but they don't stay. The vast majority don't stay uh, because of the lack of opportunity. And especially when the war begins, as the war production picks up, opportunities pop up elsewhere. And so if, if they have an opportunity to go back to the Northeast with larger Jewish populations or elsewhere with maybe family, uh, they go. Uh, by 1945, you have seven remaining in Montgomery. And this is the case even after the war with the resettlement of, of Holocaust survivors, uh, displaced persons, that they really don't remain in the South, in, in places like Montgomery, or even Birmingham to a lesser extent, um, because of the lack of opportunity. Also, in, in something I, I, I 
we see clearly in the, in the post-war period is because of the racism. Because they're coming into contact all of a sudden with the Jim Crow laws, which for many are very, very similar uh, to the discrimination, the Nuremberg laws that were, uh, were placed on the Jewish population in Germany. So many, they're not going to speak out, so they leave. Um, now, I wanted to give you one more illustration, but I'm not sure I have, I have the time. One of the most, and I'll just mention this briefly, the couple you see here uh, resettled in Selma, um, Herman and Frieda Berger. Uh, they were one of the most successful of those to resettle uh, in Alabama. They came in 1938. Um, in fact, their daughter was born not long after they settled in Selma. She was the, the first, uh, really the first child born of refugees in Alabama. And they, you know, they had a hard time assimilating into society. And again, uh, according to their daughter, Hannah, uh, English, learning the language was, was the biggest uh, hurdle. But also the cultural differences. Um, you know, if, if you, let's say you go from a strict Orthodox home, Jewish Orthodox home, and you go to Selma, well, you're going to find out you can't keep kosher. You're going to find out that, well, many of the Jewish families who grew up in Alabama, who were born and raised, might just have Christmas trees. So it, 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 was, it, was, it was a very difficult time. Now, they, they, they succeeded very well. In fact, they lived all of their life in Selma. In fact, uh, even after the war, they brought uh, some of their family members that had gone to Shanghai uh, to Selma. Uh, now, in the end, I think uh, both lost their parents in the Holocaust. Uh, and they lost siblings in the Holocaust. I don't remember exactly how many. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Berger lost maybe two brothers. Uh, Frida lost, I can't remember if it was three other siblings. So, uh, you know, it, they had to deal with that as well, you know, with the loss of, of family members and trying to, to, to acculturate. So it was very difficult uh, for them to do that. By the end of 1941, just to, to wrap it up here, by the end of 1941, 14,000 refugees had been resettled by the NRS, that is, those from New York. Um, we don't know the numbers in Alabama simply because they were so transient. We know when they came, but we don't know when they left. Uh, and, and it's a very fluid thing, nor do we know how many came total that were brought by families is something that, that, that we really don't have records on. So how many were brought into Alabama from members of their family prior to the NRS uh, trying to resettle those? So we just, we, we don't know. But what we do know is we have a great many productive citizens the, that, that uh, came out uh, of this resettlement uh, attempt and those who reached Alabama. <laughs> Uh, by means of their family. Now, let me just conclude with this. Um, and this is, a, I think, the general thrust of my book here, uh, which of this is a small part. This helped, and I didn't touch on this, but this helped the Alabama Jewish communities. And here in Montgomery, it, it, it's... You know, you've got the reform community. You've got the, uh, at least at that time, the Orthodox community of a, of, of a good of Israel. You had the, the Sephardic community, uh, at Zahayim, uh, a very diverse community. And, and really, you had three different communities. And there was a lot of distrust between it. Um, I remember when I first started this research project, uh, this was not my major major thing. I, I, I was working on African Americans and the Holocaust. And I, I figured I'll take two weeks just to get the Jewish perspective. <laughs> well, here I am, I don't know how many years later, and I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, so, it, but it, what happens here, and this is just one aspect of this, coming together to support 
Jews in need in Europe brings Jews in Alabama closer together. It doesn't alleviate all the problems, the, the, the religious, the cultural, the social problems, but it does bring them together. It makes them certainly coalesce. Um, there's also that tendency to, to still see sectional differences here. And that was very, very clear, seeing it as a New York problem or not getting along and that, that it, basically that inherent distrust of, of, of Yankees uh, was part and parcel of that. Um, you know, and last, I, I, I think this is, uh, this is really part of this response because it, it's not just, it's not the only way they responded to Nazism. It's not the only way they responded to international events. And what it shows, I think, is that contrary to a number of people's opinions about Alabama being out in the provinces, you know, the, the provincials, they were very tied into what was going on, not just, uh, not just around their, their, own little, uh, their own little section, but nationally and internationally. So they were, in, in fact, I, I make the argument in the book, they were cosmopolitan. They're not provincial. And they're very active nationally uh, with, with these rescue and relief efforts. I'm done, right? OK. Thank you. Now we have time for questions. Does anybody? We have time for questions. If you have a question, raise your hand. We will hand you the microphone, and please speak directly into the microphone. Thank you. Uh, well, a question it arises. Uh, you didn't mention, did, did the burgers make a go of it in Selma? And they, did, did they, yes. they did, yes. They did. Did they learn to speak English? They did, yes. They did. Uh, he was a tailor. He was a tailor, yes. Uh, in, in fact, the reason they came to Selma is because uh, the, the tailor who had been there had died, and so they had a need, and that's how they ended up in Selma. You know, had that not happened, who knows where they would have ended up? Uh, no, no, that was, a, uh, that was a, a department store in Selma. They just happened to be standing in front of it. Yes, ma'am. Actually, it's not a question, but I worked with Hannah Burger for a number okay. of years, and I shopped at Bendersky's on many occasions in Broad Street in Selma. For a long time, it was Kaiser's and Kepper's and, you know, just about yes, all of the dry goods and dress clothes. And a lot of those have died, but the stores are still mm -hmm. there. Yeah, the vast majority of merchants, uh, not just in Selma, but in Montgomery and in Birmingham and others, were, were Jewish. Yes, sir. The name Bandersky is interesting. I got a old NCR crank-style cash register at a yard sale years ago, the tape printer read Bendersky's and Sons, hmm. Selma, Alabama. It's now an El old Alabama town in one of the stores. Uh, yes, I w was an engineer in Israel in the 70s, and I worked with a bunch of Israelis who uh, actually uh, thought it was hilarious to see uh, Alabama Jews come in over there, and uh, uh, they said, look how spoiled they are. They wouldn't last a minute in some of our communes. But they pointed out, and by the way, they were all from other countries who now were Isra Israelis, uh, said, Alice, in a way, uh, we, we are to blame for the prejudice against us because we are very uh, insular. We refuse to be assimilated it is our emphasis on doing kosher stuff, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But that's a good thing because whenever we didn't have a country, it kept us all together. But it's a bad thing because it keeps us from assimilating. So I thought that was a fascinating point. You know, not, not, to, not to expound too much on that, but that is one of the things I deal with uh, in the book is, is that's one of the, the, the cultural differences between the reform community and the Orthodox community is, um, you know, it, it, where Reformed Jews looked at assimilation as acculturation as the key to success, um, many Orthodox and others believe they're, they're, they're not maintaining that Jewish identity. And that led to a lot of the, 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 the conflict 
uh, at least at that point. Yes. Um, when you said that, how many uh, soldiers did you say Jewish soldiers were sent to Fort Rucker? You know, it, 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 that's another number we don't have a firm handle on because they would come in and they would, would ship out. They would come in and they would ship out. So I, I relied on the numbers from the Jewish Welfare Board um, that they tried to keep track of the numbers through working with the local community and, and, and uh, the chaplain, the, and there was a Jewish chaplain there. And so they were estimating. We just, we don't know. But it was, you know, they, they I think at the height, I don't remember how many they had, how many total soldiers they had, but they estimated, you know, if you look at most coming down from New York, you have to, to imagine a, a large percentage are Jews. Okay, because I was thinking that you said, all, like, was it 4,000 or something? 40, About 000. 40. Yeah. If, if that many Jewish soldiers were mm -hmm. sent there, then they're being picked out to be sent there. They're being separated out. Well, no, and that was just in a, because you're talking about uh, over 100,000 soldiers well, being stationed, and, and they're just estimating this is how many Jewish soldiers uh, that there are. And, and the reason they're doing that is they're trying to figure out, well, what kind of programming can we do? Uh, what kind of religious services can we offer? And you're talking about a, a community with maybe 20, 25 families uh, in a very small uh, synagogue. So it, that, it, it posed enormous logistical problems for them. Uh, but that was just, that was just a, an example. We don't know how many... Uh, th that was just an estimate on the part of uh, uh, those that worked with the uh, JWB. Yes, you had a, a list of the documents. You gave us a list of the documents that these people had to provide in order to qualify for immigration. Was that unusual? Is that something that applied to all countries or, or just to Germany or what? Uh, from what I gather, uh, that was across the board. Now, they could be... A lot of it depended on the consulate, too, uh, on how willing the guy. From my understanding, that is everybody had to provide that. But it's, it's also how willing the consulates themselves were to work with you. Uh, there are numerous instances of, of Jews making their way to consulates, uh, you know, after 1940 in Vichy, France, to an American consulate trying to get out. And there's, you know, once they realize they're Jewish, oh, well, we're closed. Oh, we don't have any forms. Uh, come back again later. Uh, so it, there, it was, it was a, a conscious effort, uh, anti-Semitic effort to prevent Jews uh, from coming into the U.S. Why was it a, a stigma to not have them assimilate into agriculture? You know, it, there were a number of entities that wanted to provide this, this opportunity. Uh, the NRS, the, the executive director of the NRS, said that most of those coming from Germany and Austria simply weren't suited for agricultural work. Because we're not talking about Eastern European Jews, we're talking about those from Germany, and the vast majority, he, he stated, is that they're, they're, they're not suited, they're, they, you know, they don't want to work on a farm, and especially if you look at, at farms that are so, so isolated from others. You know, think about working on a farm out in the Black Belt. Uh, you're, 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 there is no community for you to, to fall back on. And so that's, that was their explanation. We have time for one more question. I've always heard all my life about how the Jewish community, particularly in Alabama, uh, assisted the rebel forces, the Confederacy, financially. And that most of them, most of the bankers and the investment houses, bankrupted themselves helping the Confederacy. What possessed them to be so much on a southern phase of life 
I can't speak about the the Civil War. I I, I don't know. Don't know about that. I I I, I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay. I, I, I probably just I, something I can't answer. Dr. Puckett will be here after the program to autograph your book, or uh, you may have more questions for him. He'll be glad to talk with you. Uh, be sure and turn in your evaluation form, and thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.